I will talk about the Aflux search API. Cormac already talked about the, um, the search page, which is very nice to use if you only want to look up um, a certain entry or a certain small, do a small search. But if you actually want to use our data in machine learning context, or if you want to you do a more a much broader search, then uh, the search page is not particularly helpful, especially because you cannot easily use these results to uh, in your own machine learning model in your own workflow. And for that, we have the so-called Aflux Search API. The Aflux Search API is designed to uh, just merge the AFL search API, search page, and the entries that we have into one big framework and one big, big app that you can use. And it essentially does everything using the query part of the URI. So you can even use AFLOX in a browser. And here's the essential request structure that we have. We have our server. Which is the uh, which is AFLUX org slash API slash AFLUX, and then we have the query portion of the URI, which is used to actually generate the the search that you're trying to trying to make. And the search page is using AFLUX in the background. It's the engine that drives the search page that Cormac was talking about. So this is a simple structure, but of course it's not that easy. AFLUX has a little bit of a learning curve, and I will talk about the matchbook in particular and the directors later on. Let's see how far we go, get in these 50 minutes. Um, as, as I said, if I don't get to certain points or if there are some things that you were not able to follow along with, the slides that you get in the chat and that are being sent out on Canvas will have all the commands that I'm going to be using uh, on the slides. So you can always go back and review. The matchbook is essentially where the search happens. Um, the, uh, the materials keywords with all the arguments that you might be using. We do have a certain help directive that um, gives you all the properties that you need. This is, here's a link in your collab notebook. And before you, uh, yeah, before you actually uh, use the collab, uh, let's make sure to create a copy in our drive so we don't overwrite anything. And yeah, here's the link and you can, we can click on this one, open it in a new tab and we can see we have a JSON object. Uh, if you have Firefox, which I recommend you use, you get it nicely formatted. Here's the raw data. Otherwise, um, I think if you add format, JSON, it actually pretty prints this, but Firefox will always use its own J, uh, JSON viewer. So here you have all these, all the properties that we have in the database. You can go through them, get a description, the units and everything. But this is essentially how we're, what we're going to do for the rest of this Aflux tutorial. We will always uh, use a URL lib and build a request. And we, we execute this code in Colab hitting control enter, uh, we, uh, you will get these results back. And this is essentially what we're going to do for the rest of, for the remainder of this, of this talk, we're going to use the, um, the URL lib Python framework and, uh, the, the, uh, the API, uh, for Aflux and the request here in this case, help. Um, we will first go through a couple of matchbook features so you can learn how to build a query yourself. And at the end, we will deal with the directives, which are giving us a little bit more control about how we return results. So if you scroll down, you see that we have, there's a question in the chat. Um, do we have a tool to find interstitial positions in a supercell with 108 atoms, for example? Um, we do, it's a little older. Uh, I think we, we do have it, 108 atoms. It's a very expensive calculation. Um, I would probably use it for smaller cells. Um, I will have to look up what the exact command is, but you will need a full for this. We don't have an online tool for that particular question. But back to, back to the matchbook. Um, 
The matchbook will consist of properties and operators. We will use the following properties here, mostly species and the band gap. Uh, but we also have properties that we will also have operators that we will be talking about throughout the rest of this uh, of this talk. Uh, so most of the important most important ones are block and or or not, which is what we are going to use quite a lot. But also the loose operator, uh, the string and mute operators have their use. Now we'll talk about them briefly if we have time. But I'll mostly focus on these four here: block and or and not. And I will show pretty much right away how we can use them to reproduce uh, searches that we that we can do on the search page. As I said, the important part here is going to be the matchbook. The matchbook is what we will be focused on in the first part of this. Let's not worry about the directive, I'll explain later what it means. But we want to start with a search here in the ICSD catalog. We want to look at compounds containing chromium and three species. For that, you need to know how do I search in a catalog? How do I search for species? And how do I set the number of species to three? And for that, you can use the help directive to find the appropriate properties. I've given them to you up here in that table. So let's do species is chromium. So we see we just have the property and then parentheses, we add uh, the chromium of the, the species in, in that we want to filter on. Then we separate it by comma, n species is three, because we want three species. And the catalog is ICSD, which means only look for ICSD entries. If we don't want to limit this like that, we just don't use the catalog matchbook. So what this script is going to do is it's going to put a link together. Um, if Colab doesn't take that away from me, uh, it essentially there's the scroll bar. There's no it's inconvenient. Ah, there it is. So it prints out a link, and you see all these this matchbook that I entered here and the directive that I entered here are just comma separated attached to that link, and it returns a JSON. And here we see already we have one of eight sixty two which means we get 862 entries back. And you can verify that this is true by going to the search page, you get the same result back. We also get the compounds, the species, um, some default properties like AUID, space strip relax, and Pearson symbol relax, which is also what you get when you're on the search page, and the other two uh, keywords we were looking for. And again, if you want to look at the actual April search page, you can verify that you're getting the same results back. But that was a simple search. What if we are only interested here, we have a couple of oxides in there. What if we are a uh, bigger font resume in screen, please? Is that better? Yes, excellent. So just in case you couldn't read it, um, the matchbook, I can also post this in the chat real quick. Uh, the, the matchbook is here. We have species chromium, number of species three and catalog is ICSD. And what it does is it queries or it, it basically sends a request to this link here and um, it returns a JSON that shows we have 862 results and you get the results back here. Let's say we want to exclude oxygen from the results. And um, again, we have species chromium, and then we want to not have oxygen in there. For that, we are adding the and operator, which is the comma, and not oxygen is exclamation point O. The say the other the other parts are the same. We want number species three and catalog. ICSD. Okay, so species chromium and not oxygen, number of species three catalog is ICSD, and then you can run the script, which will add the matchbook and the directive together into one query, and then sends prints this link here, 
and queries that particular link. You can even open that link here to go ahead and do that in the browser. And you get the same results back as a JSON. So you don't have to use Python. Anything that can query a URL can use this. Nice, yes, I agree, it's very nice. So yeah, it doesn't have to be Python. Anything that can query a URL can do this. Now I'll show you the AND operator. Let's go to the OR operator. It works exactly the same way. We want compounds from the ICSD catalog, three species. We write that down already. Number of species is three. So now what we want to do with the species is we want to have chromium or manganese. And the OR operator is the colon operator. So it's chromium or manganese. When we run this, the very same way, and you look at your results, you will see some have chromium. I think a lot of them will have chromium. Let me see if I find something with manganese, so you know that I'm not lying to you. Here is aluminum, cobalt, manganese. So there's no chromium in there, but there's manganese in there, and that fulfills the query. And um, you will get those results back. Naturally, we have more results than before because we have results that don't have chromium in it, but manganese instead. Any questions about this is a little bit, it takes a little bit of getting used to first, but it's very important to understand this particular part. Uh, I can add the matchbook real quick into this, just this save to a file. Um, it, doesn't, but you can. Um, it just returns the JSON. It, depending on what you're using, you can use this. You can say, for example, this response when you load the JSON uh, into a file if you want to. You can even use wget if you're, or a CURL if you're familiar with it and just uh, redirect it into an output file. You can definitely do that. There's nothing stopping you, but itself, it doesn't save into a file. You will have to do that yourself. Any other questions? Let me put the matchbook into the chat for people who just. Copy and paste that. Okay. We can make this actually the, the logic arbitrarily complex. For example, we can retrieve any compounds with three species containing chromium and selenium or chromium and tellurium. So chromium and selenium would be this logic, chromium comma selenium, and we can put that in parentheses. And then we have the other condition or chromium and tellurium. And this would fulfill that exact logic required, logical requirement, chromium and selenium or chromium and tellurium. And species three and catalog. Okay, um, they get two questions here. Why are aluminum compounds shown if we initialize aluminum somewhere? So we, the, the query that we have, when we look back into the match book, here with the species chromium or manganese and N species three. That doesn't mean it's exclusively chromium. It just says it has to contain chromium or it has to contain manganese. And number of species has to be three. So it could be anything else. It needs to be chromium and something else and something else. Uh, it could contain aluminum. It could, in this case, mean dysprosium. If you want to have exclusively chromium compounds, you want you, you want to you need to do species chromium and n species equals one. Then you're sure that there's only chromium in the in, in the result. So that's why you have some aluminum compounds in there. What's important is that the chromium here is inside because that is what you requested. Uh, if you don't want aluminum in your in your result, 
I can actually show you. That's definitely possible. If you don't want any aluminum, then you just write and not aluminum. Put that in the chat, exclude it aluminum. Then you can be sure that there's no, there's not going to be aluminum in your, in your response. You can, you will see that when you go through all of this, aluminum is not going to be among any of them. The second question, uh, could the OR operator also give a structure with both chromium and manganese? Yes, absolutely. Um, it can absolutely do that. Uh, the OR is not an exclusive OR. We don't have an exclusive OR operator in AFLUX. You have to kind of build it yourself. But yes, um, chrome or manganese can mean compounds with chromium and manganese. Good question. I like the question. So here's the complex logical, the complex logical operator here or condition that we have here. And it, there's an error, oh, it was not done. Got distracted by the question. So. Here we see that we have some chromium, selenium, chromium, selenium, chromium, tellurium. All of these compounds that you will get back will have either chromium and selenium or chromium, tellurium. I don't think they will have both, but that's only because we don't have anything like that in the database, not because of the, the request. You can also, of course, rephrase the, uh, let me put that in the chat real quick. You can also, of course, rephrase it by writing chromium and selenium or tellurium, they are logically equivalent and will give you the same result. So it doesn't matter how you phrase it as long as the logic is, um, is, is, the, is the correct one. Any questions about, about this, about these logical operators so and, and or can be used just like any other logical operator and species, they're particularly useful. Doesn't appear to be the case. If you have a question that comes up, then the default type, what does lose give? I'm not sure that that question seems to be related to symmetry. We'll get, we can get back to that after afterwards. We don't have any tolerances here at Aflux. That's the symmetry situation. Or are you talking about the loose operator? Loose operator has nothing to do with the tight and loose symmetry. Uh, symmetry. That's just a different, it's, it's just a name for an operator that I'm going to introduce right now. So suppose we want to have bank gaps of all quaternary compounds that we have in the A-flow database. So the property for that, um, there are 115 found, but only 64 are listed. That's a good question. There are only 150, there are 115 requests, but only 64 are listed. How can we get the rest? I will talk about this later on when we talk about the directives. And um, yeah, I will talk about this in, in a few minutes. So let's assume we want to have the band gaps for all quaternary compounds. The property for that is E gap. And the number of species is four. Let's get the, let's do the calculation. Not the calculation, let's do the request and search. And we're going to get E gaps that are null. So what does this mean? It means we don't have the band gap calculated for this for this particular compound. So that's uh, because Aflux just gives you back what you're requesting. And uh, if we don't have the band gap calculated, it's not going to give you a null result. So how can we make sure that we only get results back that actually have a band gap? And that's where the loose operator comes into play. So again, number of species is four. And for E gap, we are going to use the star operator. That's what we call the loose operator. 
then you put that matchbook in the chat. If you add this loose operator, the star, into your request, you're telling Aflux only return if the result is not null. So only if we have a band gap calculated. And here we see we have band gaps calculated. Uh, they're mostly going to be zero because a lot of these are metals. But we do have these, we do have now 8,222 results results instead of the aforementioned like 458 because we decided to only calculate the band gaps for these particular compounds in the past. But yeah, this is the loose operator here that you need. The loose operator can do a lot more. It can also limit your search results. Cormac shown in the session before that we can look for band gaps that are in between two and five electron volts or between one and three electron volts and the loose operator can do the same thing. So let's go to the next, where we also only want to see bank uh, results where the band gap is one electron volt or larger. To do that, you phrase the logical operation like this, E gap one star. And that means it's one or greater. Oops. N species, let's say N species again is four. Put that matchbook in the chat as well, in case you don't see it. And here we see we have band gaps that are non zero, all the zero band gaps are gone and we see that the first entry let's go all the way to the top has an e gap as a band gap of exactly one electron volt so one star means one or um, one electron volt or greater how do we limit the band gap to between one and three electron volts uh, this is again just a combination of these logical operators so we know one star means one or greater than one. And you can do the same thing with three or smaller than three by using star three. That would return everything that is three or smaller. And how do we get this between three and one electron volt? By just combining the two. So one star and star three means needs to be one or greater than one and three or smaller than three. And together we have band gaps between one and three electron volts and in species it is three. And this time I will return everything just so you see that I'm actually doing, and this is gonna be done with paging. We're going to talk about this later on. So, so you see that I'm actually telling you the truth. Oops. And species should be four, not three. Oops. Okay, I'll just tell us how we're running. Let's do this again. Are the results sorted by bank gap value? Yes, they are. I will talk about sorting in a little bit. They are sorted by bank gap value because it's the one that's first. But yes, we see E gap here, the largest is 2.9998. I guess we don't have anything that's exactly three. And when we go all the way up to the beginning of the results, you will see, and it's probably gonna be very long. Because we have a lot of results, which is exactly why we don't return everything at once because it's going to get long if you're actually looking at it. Um, e gap one is the first result, but yes, it's, it's sorted by the bank gap. Good question. Any more questions? Paging zero gives us everything, yes. I will talk about paging in a little bit. Uh, be careful with paging zero. It gives you everything, but that also means that if you do this in a browser, 
or yeah, if you do this in a browser and you're getting maybe like 400,000 results back, your browser might crash or will probably crash if you get a lot of results back. So be careful with paging zero. But I'll talk about paging it in a, in a little bit. So just to summarize, the match boot is essentially where the entire search limitations happen. Um, you can search by property. Uh, you can also use logical operators on the species to really tailor what kind of compounds you want back. And here we can see that we also can filter by property values in case we have numbers. Yeah, streaming output truncated to the last 5,000 lines. Uh, you can see paging zero can really give us a lot of results back. Um, so to be used with care, especially if you're visualizing your output. The last two operators I want to just briefly mention um, because they are not used very frequently. Let's assume we want to look for our so-called AUID. It's the unique ID that every single entry has. And we want to just look for that particular entry, maybe get some other properties back for it. And if you do that, you will be surprised that you don't get anything. Why is that the case? We have a colon here in that, in that value, and Aflux will think this is an operator. To prevent this, you can use the single quotes, and you get this one, and you get the actual entry back. The other thing that you may want to do is to mute output. So let's say we want to do our prior search with n species 4. It will return n species 4 constantly with every single one, and that is just unnecessary data. So just to show you what that looks like. Here we have n species four with every single entry because that's what we limited everything with. And that's kind of redundant. So if we want to avoid this, we can use the dollar sign um, to suppress that output. So you see n species isn't there. Um, we can also mute any of these default properties like AUID. If you're not interested in the AUID, we can. Get rid of this one too. And you will see. And N species, Marco. Ah, right. Thank you, Corey. N species. Oh. Yeah, you will get nonsense back if you do that. Yeah, you see AUID is not in the final results. I just wanted to show you that real quick. Those are not uh, particularly complex operators. What's more important are the directives. We already talked about paging. Some of you already figured out a little bit what paging does. Um, paging, looking back at the, uh, the e-gap uh, between one and three electron volts and number of species, um, the paging directive, now we're dealing with the directive, basically tells you the, uh, the, the page of your result that you get back. So the default is 64 entries per page. Somebody already noticed that we only get 64. And here we see it till the end, we only get to 64 and then we're done. How do we get the next 64? By changing paging to two. Put those two lines in the chat. Here we see we get the entries until 128. And if we go to three, we would get the next 64, etc. So if you have a lot of results that you want to return, you don't want to get a huge packet back. You can just do a while loop until you get nothing, uh, until you return, you return some empty array, then you know you're done. What if you want more results per page back? That's perfectly possible. 
let's say paging one comma 100 means that the first page should be, uh, the page should be 100 entries long. Here we see at the end, we get to, to page 100. And if we want the second page, I'll just copy that while it's running, put that in the chat. We will get up to 200, for, starting from entry 101. The other thing you can do with paging is um, return results in, as an array. So instead of having um, paging one as a JSON index, which is nice if you're actually looking at it, but maybe not quite as useful in a, um, in a, in a script setting, instead of having these keys here, you can use the mute operator on the paging directive. And you will get an array back. So you see all the keys are gone. And if you look at it at the very end, you see you have an actual array. So if you don't care about any of this ordering or if you want to know what the key is, you can also return it as an array like that. And the last thing I want to show you about paging, somebody already figured it out in the chat, paging zero returns everything. And by that, I really mean everything. This request should be fairly harmless, but if you uh, get a ton of results back and we have three and a half million entries, so it's very possible that you might, you might crash your browser if you actually look at this in the browser. Can you share again the source from where we can learn read about all these syntaxes? Uh, there's two there's two resources where you can learn. One is the PDF that I gave you in the slides uh, that should be on Canvas. The other one, uh, if you look at the very top of your Colab notebook, uh, we'll just go. I'll, I'll send the link too. There's two. There's a, there's a reference in your Colab notebook, and Corey's going to dig out the paper. You know? uh, we also I'd also recommend going to the AFO School videos that we have online. Uh, really, this is more of a, this is something that you learn. Um, okay, could you share the updated copy of this Colab notebook? The slides has all the commands inside. All the commands should be in the PDF, and then you can look at the look at them yourself. But I can also share the filled out Colab notebook with the exercises at the end. Yes, I can definitely. The third command menu is available on the AFLO web pages. Uh, when you copy the website into a directive, what website did you copy and what did that do? I'm not sure what that question means. Uh, the websites or the, the URLs that are used are essentially, can show you a link like this. Yes, the AFO, thank you, Corey. The AFOX paper, let me actually find one that has less entries. The AFOX paper has all the references and I would recommend really using and playing with it as much as you can, uh, using the AFO school videos, uh, using this call app notebook, because that is really something that it's better to learn while you do it and just experiment with what you can do. But the links are essentially, uh, this is the API, aflo.org slash API slash AFLUX. And this here is the request that you're sending. And you can click on this link too, if you want to. And you will get the results in your browser. You can use wget or curl to get the result back and download it. These are good questions. I put a website in the directive. I don't think I, I don't think I did. Maybe we can talk about this during 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 the break. Uh, let's uh, let me get back to you on that one later. What I did put into a into a matchbook was an AUID. Maybe that's what you're referring to. That's just an ID. 
question. Yes, I will, I will get back to the AU idea at the end. Does that sound good? So we can move on. Could you use a for the similar monitors for liquid chromatography column? No, I'm very sure that we can't do that. Uh, we don't. We don't typically do molecules, and we don't have. We don't do like liquid dynamics. This is all crystals. Somebody else asked about sorting, and uh, when you look at the bank gap, you saw that. Um, we do again paging one. We saw that it's that it sorts by the band gap. Somebody already asked that question. Very observant and notice that this is sorted by the band gap here, and it's all sorted in ascending order. So what do we do if we want? What do we want to do? Or what do we need to do to sort it in descending order? To do that, we change the paging directive to negative one. That also works for zero. Um, if you do direct, if you do paging negative zero, you get everything back, but sort it in descending order. So you see everything here is on the highest side and the highest one is 2.9998 electron volts. So negative, negative values do sort in descending order. And you always sort by the first property. So this one I'm just showing, it's all in your Colab notebook. Uh, just to compare, let's say we add another property like spin atom. We see we have here an entry with a high with the highest band gaps, and they all have very small magnetic moments. Here's the again the same entry with 2.9998 electron volt as the band gap. But if we compare this when we put spin atom first, we will get something very different. And here the code, you can just run your collab notebook. Um, there's no point in typing all this. Oh, forgot to add paging, uh, paging minus one. Otherwise you will not get, I will update this in the, in the actual notebook. You will see when you go all the way back, the band gap is not 2.9998 anymore. It's the one with the highest spin. Unfortunately, AFOX cannot do complex sorting. It cannot sort first by spin atom, then by E gap, then by N species. It just sorts by the first, the first one. There's another question. Could you use A for determinant materials band gap based on atomic composition? Say so graphene dope are functionalized with different molecules. You can add the composition. Uh, you can add the number of species. Uh, discuss this a bit in the next section, then I'll defer to Corey, but you can put the species in there. Uh, with molecules, uh, you can definitely not, if we, we don't have it in the database, and Corey will talk a bit more about it in machine learning session, how to actually determine this. The last thing, I think I'm running a little bit short on time, um, I want to introduce you to is aliases. So we have certain aliases, the same that we had on the search page. Cormac was, for example, looking for alkali metal and calcogens. So how would this look like in AFLUX? It's assume we want to have zinc blend with a space group number 216, Pearson symbol CF8. That's just what zinc blend is. And we have a metal and a calcogen. To do this search, we would have to do this oxygen or sulfur or selenium or tellurium and all the metals. This is an absolute monstrosity of a query. And nobody wants to do that, including me. Uh, I can run it anyway. So for that, we introduced aliases. Instead of using, typing them out all out manually, see we have 350 results we're getting back. And so typing them all out manually, uh, you can just use calcogens and metals, and you will get the same results back. See, we also get 350. You can convince yourself by just running it in your Colab notebook that these are the same results. And these are the aliases that we have. They should be fairly self-explanatory. We have metals, alkali metals, alkali earths, transition metals, lanthanides, uh, metals that don't fall in any of the groups, 
and especially the ones that are to the right of the transition metals in the periodic table, boron, carbon, nictogens, calcogens, halogens, and nonmetals. These are all aliases you can use, so you don't have to type out this absolutely enormous query if you just want to look for any metal uh, that, you, that you might find. I think I'm out of time, uh, so I won't be able to go through the exercises, but I will post a collab notebook and I will, I will let uh, Professor Takeuchi know where it is uh, with the exercises done. Other than that, you also have the, uh, the PDF with all the slides, so you can go through and look through the commands that you, that you may have missed. Any more questions about AFLUX? I know this was very short, maybe a little bit, but it was very dense. If you have more questions or if you want to look up a longer session about this, um, then look, I would recommend you look at the AFLUX school videos that we have. So aliases are built in keywords, says a question. So the aliases are built in keywords. If I want to search oxygen and chlorine and fluorine, there is no alias to use, right? That's correct. Yes, they're all built in. Uh, for oxygen, chloride, and fluoride, yeah, you, I mean, this is not a complicated request, but yeah, if, if anything falls out of the, uh, of these purviews, then uh, yes, you cannot use AFLUX for that. And there's a comment, uh, think you could define your own in Python pretty easily. Yes, you can definitely do that. Is there a way to know what is contained in, for example, calcogens? Um, we are working on these directives, but other than that, um, the only way to know this is by, by, by chemistry. Um, calcogens are a specific group in the periodic table, but I think we're working on actually having a directive that explains what exactly these aliases are. So we are, we should be pushing that fairly soon. Maybe available in the next version, no need to check. <laughs>